so with that, we bring in, and I love this, the Charles W. Caldwell Jr. 25 head coach of football at Princeton University. Now you say, well, what is this called? I, I'm, I'm guessing the head coaching position is endowed at Princeton, kind of like uh, the chairman or the, uh, the dean of the political science department would be. That's the tradition of an Ivy League school and a Princeton. And by the way, Coach Serace played at Princeton for an Ivy League champion, and he coached another one this past year, 10-0. And, and they, I mean, they they basically uh, kicked everybody really good in that schedule this year. Closest game they had, I think, was Dartmouth at 14-9. to But Coach Serace, good morning, and, and really appreciate you joining us. Yeah, good. So, so Charles Caldwell, he was a, a football, baseball player, Princeton. He played for the New York Yankees. He was a pitcher. Supposedly, he hit Wally Tip the head with a pitch, and that's why Wally Tip had the headache, and Lou Gehrig then took over, and that's how Wally Tip came about. So there's a little myth around for Charles Caldwell um, in terms of that. <laughs> I, I, I like the story, and – I also like the tradition. If you don't mind, I'm going to tell you a quick story. Go ahead. Yesterday, I'm on I'm on with a station in Oklahoma City that I do some work for, and their uh, one of their co-hosts is a is a former All American guard at Oklahoma State that I know pretty well, and we're talking about the offensive uh, coordinator position, and and he goes, yeah, but he went to Princeton. To, to get the OC. I mean, what's going on? And again, Mike Yersich, a tremendous football coach that never, I don't think, was appreciated as much as he should have been here, was the last OC that came from Shippensburg State. And you know as well as Coach Gundy does, you can find good football coaches at a lot of places that aren't called the NFL or Power Five. There's good football coaches at every level. But I said to him, I said, well, you know what? These guys went through the Ivy this year like nobody's business. And I think I saw somewhere where they protested the, the, the conference, the Ivy League, to let them play in the FCS playoffs. And I think they would have done pretty good. Coach, you'll love this. My son is the head coach at a junior college, NEO A&M. And he was actually recruiting. He came through the house in, in, in Edmond on yesterday. And he was there when I said that. And he's behind me and he goes, Dad, Dad, you're kidding. And, uh, and I said, well, there's a coach here that wants to argue with me. Coach, he got he Googled, got on your Princeton football page, looked at the results from last season, real quickly looked at the highlights of, I think it was your game with Monmouth. And mm-hmm. in about two minutes, he comes back in the room. I mean, it was no more than two minutes. He, he said, hey, that was a stupid comment. Stupid comment on my part. They would have won. They would have won several playoff games. <laughs> and it was that quick that he looked at the results and looked at the tape and said, "Wait a second! I just said something really dumb." So uh, that that I, I thought that was funny. He quickly amended his. He goes, "No, they they should have been in the playoffs." Yeah. Well, so, Monmouth uh, was Monmouth was the last team out. You know, the NCAA they have like the final four teams to make it and the final four left out. You know. Bobbitt was the last one, so that, that was one of the one of, that was a really good team we beat that day. Well, uh, again, and, and is that a, I mean, before we get into Coach Gleason, I, I know the Ivy League does not let their champion uh, and let their teams participate in the FCS playoff, so your season's capped at ten. But uh, was that accurate? Did you guys look into to maybe changing that because? You had a team last year that, that could have done some real damage in the in the bracket. Yeah, no, I I think when they made that rule, it made sense. We were not wanting to join the Power Five for whatever reason, good, bad, and different. Um, in retrospect, if you want to be the top school in the country academically, you don't want the football coach being more important than the president. You know what I mean? And at the Ohio State and Alabama's and Oklahoma State and everywhere else, the football coach brings in revenue and spirit and enthusiasm that is greater than the president. So, in retrospect, that might have been the right decision. We're not in 1974 anymore, though. So, I think we're moving towards uh, joining the rest of the uh, uh, football programs, and I think we're getting closer to being able to play and challenge ourselves against the North Dakota State, hopefully in the near future. 
I, I did have a chance yesterday to introduce myself and say hello to uh, to Coach Gleason, and and uh, we've heard from several people. Chad Canoff was was on with us earlier this week, and some of the folks from Princeton. I've been excited about talking to you. Real simple. What what kind of guy is is Coach Gleason? Oh my God, he's the best. I mean, literally, I uh, I get the job. I hire James Perry, James Coach Sean at Williams, and. And Sean is at Del Barton High School, great high school, uh, private school, a little bit north of here, about an hour away. And Sean is coming over every day. And I say this to everybody: Hey, you know, you want to, you know, hey, you're always welcome, right? Come on whenever you want. Sean's the only guy to ever take me up on the offer. He was here three to four times a week as we put our offense in, studying us, working with us, you know, working around his bowling coaching duties, his baseball duties. He was at every practice. So my brother has a job open that summer, and I said to my brother, you have to hire this guy. This guy is going to be a superstar. And my brother hires him to be the offensive coordinator at Barely Dickinson University. And Sean does a great job for my brother. I mean, Barely Dickinson has struggled historically. Last year was maybe the best year in the history of the program. Um, And Sean did a great job with them. We were able to bring him in here. Is the running back coach. I promoted him to special teams coordinator and then offensive coordinator. Every job he did, he was extraordinary. And I think you said it earlier, I coached at Division Three and went to the NFL. It's harder to coach at Division Three. The different things you have to do, you know, you got to clean up the garbage off the field in Division Three. Um, it is harder, and the time commitment is more if you do it right. And you coach at Oklahoma State or even Princeton, you are giving resources that are incredible so you can actually just coach football and be a better coach. And Sean's going to, you know, you, uh, you know, be an even better coach around and surrounded by, you know, the resources he has up there. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm fortunate enough to know with, with a son that, that... – yeah. that's come up through the ranks and is a JUCO head coach, you know, you do the equipment, you do the off season, yep. you're the academic counselor. Uh, you yeah, you do it, you do it all. And, and I was going to mention you coached with the Cincinnati Bengals. You've seen the NFL level. Yep. One of the things that impressed me when I was doing my diligence on Sean, obviously, you know, he did a great job with, you know, Chad, who's a, a, a drop back, you know, passing yep. quarterback. Then with, you know, John Lovett this year and what you did with the, the dual threat. But as much as the explosive plays in the production were impressive, the lack of negative plays, the lack of turnovers, the touchdown-to-interception ratio with the quarterbacks, the lack of sacks and certainly big sacks, uh, taking care of the football, that that is impressive how few negative plays you allowed your opponents to have against you. Yeah, that, that, that's something that when, you know, we started here was important. And, you know, James Perry, our original offensive coordinator, who's now the head coach at Brown, was the most creative coach I've ever been around. You know, incredible mind. And we had to always talk before we put in something that was other people would say is crazy. Three quarterbacks in on the same play. You know, and I would say, well, there's no law against it. This looks great. Let's just make sure what's the risk. What, what's the pitfall? Sean, called, Sean actually came up with the term pitfalls. You know, what are the pitfalls? And then let's practice against those pitfalls to make sure we have an answer. And he is, we're, Sean is very creative, maybe not quite as creative as James, but Sean is the most organized person I've ever been around. Um, in fact, I used a different term when I said it to Coach uh, Gundy when uh, he was asking about Sean, uh, how organized he is. Sean is incredibly organized, you know, to the point where his game plans are we're going to run out of this personnel group 10 plays on run, 10 plays on pass, and there's no variation to that. And he is incredibly detailed and demanding and will push those guys to understand you can't win and be successful if you're turning it over two times a game. You know, we turned it over six times in 10 games. And that's with a very wide open, uh, fast pace. Although Coach Gundy told me we weren't fast, <laughs> I thought we were fast until I talked to him. And he's right; they run much faster than we are. I I was impressed, you know, 
actually watching some of them now that Sean got the job, um, you know, how fast they play uh, is really incredible. We're going to hopefully learn from them, and we maybe can take it up a notch and get better. Yeah, uh, when Coach Yersich got here, he talked about instead of tempo, turbo. And I remember very early in his career, there was a game at uh, UTSA, UT San Antonio, and the first time he unveiled turbo, and I went back and clocked it off the TV version, and Oklahoma State was averaging a play during that possession every seven seconds. In other words, seven seconds after the end of one play, they were at the line of scrimmage snapping the next one. And I was like, man, I've never seen that. That was that was a little freaky. But uh, hey, l- let me ask you this. Uh, what do you do? What do you do now? I mean, uh, you know, I, and I'm, you know, my, I don't know how much my audience is going to want to hear this, but you know, Mike Gundy comes and, and plucks an offensive coordinator that the way you've gushed, obviously a big part of your program. Now, where do you go looking? Uh, because I know there's a lot of good football coaches up in the northeastern part of the country, uh, oh, yeah. and and like I said, at a lot of different levels. Yeah, it was the same question when James Perry left. We. We, when I came to Princeton, they were averaging right about 10 points a game, a little more than 10 points a game. And within four years, we broke the all-time Ivy League record for points. Um, and then when James Perry left, I had the same question. What are you going to do? And we prepared Sean. Sean, as I said, was going to be a star. I knew James was going to become a head coach. He's just too good. Um, and I had to have somebody prepared. And Sean was ready. And I said, this guy is going to be incredible. In two years, you know, he breaks the all-time, our own all-time record that we had broke once for points in a season. And I knew after the first year, Sean wasn't going to be here long. So, you know, you prepare the next guy. And Sean's going to score, Oklahoma State's going to score, you know, they may score 50 points a game this year. So now my offensive coordinator this year is going to be the next guy to go. (laughs) So I better have the next guy prepared. And, and that's what you do is, you know, and, you know, when you look at Oklahoma State, they went through a run when he got there and they were, you know, nobody was scoring points like they were. Um, and so he was losing an offensive coordinator every year. So I got to be prepared for the same thing. And, you know, our offense and what we do, you know, we're going to change, but we're not going to change a lot. We're going to make tweaks to make us better, hopefully. But we're not going to, like, what we do, I love what we do, and I love how we do it. So I'm not going to go ahead and make these incredible changes to what we've been doing, but we're going to tweak it. You know, I'm going to learn from Sean. How do you want to play every seven seconds, right? Because we don't run to play every seven seconds. And, you know, I'm going to go through with him. How, how can we be better? And, you know, Sean, through working with the coaching staff and, and Coach Gundy, they're going to be better. And so I, I think that's the nature of this profession, that you're always looking for growth. Last thing, and, and I know a lot of people mentioned uh, passion. In fact, uh, I think it was your, your radio play-by-play uh, voice, uh, Cody Cruschel, that said, yeah. hey, when you go out to practice, you're going to hear and know <laughs> where Sh- you know Sean is on the practice field a lot quicker than you are going to see him. And uh, Chad kind of uh, you know insinuated the same thing. I can tell in your voice the passion that you have for football. And Chad said it best. He said, because being an L.A. guy, he said, Mr. Allen, he goes, uh, I got there to the Northeast, and I, I realized that there must be something in the water because they coach loud. And we had uh, Jim Knowles. I don't know if you're familiar with Coach Knowles. Oh, took over Jim, as yeah. defensive coordinator. What a great okay. Guy. Jim, Jim's fairly loud on the field, but I'm, I'm more used to defensive coaches being loud. But – uh, talk about that style of coaching that um, that uh, you know that you see up there. It, passionate, but but I mean loud and and proud. I guess is a good way to put yeah, it. Yeah, no, we love what we do. I mean, I, I my dad was a high school coach. I grew up with it, and I don't know if it's just a Northeast thing. I haven't really been other than Cincinnati anywhere else. Um, my most of my career has been up this way, and obviously a lot of our coaches have come up this way, and we recruit nationally, as you said. So. Some of the guys aren't used to how aggressive we are. But we love our players. If you don't love your players um, and you don't get the right guys, guys, like I won't recruit a guy. One of the questions we ask him, 
is imperative to us all when he recruits a quarterback. You got to know do they love football? Because if they don't love football, they're not going to be in the right place. If they don't like challenges like Princeton, they are challenged every day. Football, school, everything else. But if you love those things, when you leave here, you're going to go to the local church. You're going to be so successful. And, you know, I, I think you're going to see that with Sean. You're going to see a guy who absolutely is a gym rat who loves football and cares deeply about his players and, and how, how, they, how they act and how they behave and how they perform. Now, Coach, I, I appreciate the uh, appreciate the time you've given us, and and uh, look forward to getting to know Coach uh, more. And and you know what? The cool thing is, when Oklahoma A and M, that's the first name here, was first yep. started, Tigers. they were the Tigers. They took yep. the orange and black colors, and they went by the uh, nickname Princeton of the Plains. So, uh, I, I I don't I don't know if a degree at Oklahoma State, which I have one of those quite measures up to that ivy of princeton but uh hey at least coach gleason's going to be familiar with the colors yeah and he's got two little kids who got a lot of orange and black so they might have tigers on their stuff but they'll be wearing orange and black right from the (laughs) get-go well and i i know this i'm going to pay even more attention to following the uh the original the princeton tigers and I, i told coach uh uh, or I told uh, Chad Cruchel the other day, I, I watch Friday nights. I love the Friday night package where I can watch some Ivy League football. So, again, Coach, congratulations with your program. I appreciate your time, and I look forward to continuing following the success there at Princeton. Great. No, thank you, and I'll do the same with you guys. So, best of luck. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. Coach Cerace, uh, Bob Cerace, the head coach of the – uh, Princeton University, and again, you you got a little background on Charles Caldwell, Jr. That uh, legend has it he was the guy that hit Wally Pip, and Pip had a headache, sat down the next day, and Lou Gehrig took over for almost ever, and until Cal Ripken broke his record. But uh, anyway, appreciate Coach Sarace uh, being on with us.